Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 124 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a live program, so if you are in uh, the uh, uh, YouTube audience, appreciate you being here and joining us. Uh, we have Tracy and Summer, I believe, in there, and Anthony in there uh, as well to take your questions for Jeff Gulta Gulka. Sorry, Jeff. Ritu Charlie from uh, Stargate SG-1. He is uh, joining us in this hour. But before we dig into this, if you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal. If you click that like button, it will make a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will continue to help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops, and you'll get my notifications of any last-minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next uh, few weeks on the GateWorld.net YouTube channel and on Dial the Gate uh, later this year when we are in hiatus. As this is a live show, again, if you were in YouTube.com slash Dial the Gate, the moderators are standing by to take your questions for Jeff, which we will have at the end, uh, the latter half of the episode. But before... I'm going to catch up with him. So, without further ado, Mr. Jeff Gulka, Ritu Charlie, young Charlie from Stargate SG-1. How are you, sir? Fantastic. Thank you. How are you? I am well. Thank you so much uh, for being here, Jeff. This is, um, you know, I've been watching, you know, this episode over and over again for years through, <laughs> through my, dip, my involvement in the franchise and everything else. So, I, part of me feels like I already know you. When you were, I mean, a, a wee one. So mm -hmm. now you're 35 now. Is that right? Correct. All right. How, how, right. I know. I'm, I'm 38. <laughs> so it's like, how, I sent you the, the link to the episode. Did you rewatch it? I did. I watched it last night. How does that make you feel? What, uh, what feelings actually, percolate to the surface in a rewatch? Uh, well, I was actually really into the episode I was watching it and I was going to take notes to see if I remembered anything as I was watching it. And then after the first like 15 minutes, I stopped taking notes and I was just like, Whoa, this is a good episode. <laughs> it's a good episode <laughs> of TV. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really good. It almost made me want to start watching because I've never really watched the show okay. uh, other than, uh, I mean, when it was on back in the day, there was no internet or anything. So you'd have to watch it live on TV. So I'd watch the odd episode. Um, but it kind of was like, oh, maybe I should watch this from the beginning because this looks like a pretty darn good show. That's it is. No, are you uh, are you a sci fi fan? Oh yeah, definitely. Lost is my favorite show. Lost is your favorite show. Yes, along with various Star Treks. Um, I have a confession to make to my audience uh -oh. for the first time ever. Lost is my favorite show of all Ooh. time. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. I, I've never admitted that on the show, but you know, Stargate, the Stargates are, I'm right. obviously close to, um, Star right. Trek, I'm with you, but mm -hmm. if, if I, if I was cornered, I would say Lost is my favorite TV series of all yeah. time. So we're going to have to talk about that, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> How old were you, uh, when you knew you wanted to perform? Take me back. Um, well, apparently the story goes, uh, I think I must've been five or six years old and, uh, my aunt was on a, like a Safeway commercial or something. And then I told my mom, I want to do that. I want to be on TV uh, or something like that. And then she thought it was just a phase. Um, and then I kept asking, uh, for like a couple years to get an agent. And then eventually I think I was, must've been seven yeah. when she yeah. finally got me a, uh, ex an extra agent for background work. Um, so then I did extra work from the ages of seven till about 11. And then that's when I started uh, moving up there from the extra work. But uh, yeah, I think I must have been seven years old. And then that's when I started doing extra work. And I loved it ever since I started. So this was a family member you saw first. Yes, yes. Your, an aunt. Yes, my auntie Sherry. Yeah, she's an actress. Okay. All right. So that was, that's, I've, that's the first time I've ever heard that uh that that approach before my my family my I saw my family member in it and I was like you know what I think I can do that too, <laughs> so excellent. Um, tell us about uh, getting this role. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, it uh, was really worked out well. I had just finished uh, doing another show, so I had my head shaved. Oh, uh, okay. The they didn't do that for production. It, so 
Yeah, no, I just showed up and I was already bald and Peter loved that. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, I just went to the audition. Uh, Peter made me promise if I got the part uh, not to have any sugar on set um, in exchange for he gave me a, a, a game shark for the Sega Genesis console. I don't know if anybody remembers Sega Genesis. Yes. He, he gave me a game shark in exchange for no candy, no sugar on set. Did he not um, want you wired? Is that what it was? I'm assuming he's worked with kids before and they get all hyper and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then also I remember I had to uh, scream as loud as I could in the audition. I guess I just wanted to make sure I was comfortable screaming. I'm assuming for the scene where my mother gets shot and I'm like, no. <laughs> That's great, man. <laughs> oh. And uh, yeah, but it worked out. Yeah, I had the head shaved. And I think when I was flying back from the previous show I was working on. Yeah. I think Richard Dean Anderson might have actually been on the plane. So my, my dad was telling me that when I was asking for stories and stuff. So it was kind of just serendipitous. Wow. So was the first time you met Rick, was that uh, during the shoot or did you manage? Did, yeah. Did you manage to meet him before? Okay. No, no, no. It was on the shoot. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Peter DeLuise uh, is one of my all time just favorite humans. Um, mm -hmm. him, and, him and his brother, David, they, they are they are the best people uh some some of the best people that that i've ever had the pleasure of knowing and you know i've i've heard that peter is is a wonder to work with you know like especially when, when the work is really clicking it's like this guy is he's gonna make you laugh in one hand and then okay straight stone face and action and action <laughs> is that the case uh i'm assuming yeah it was like 20 years ago right for me so it's a little hard to remember specifics on set um, but I mean, watching the episode, he definitely got my best performance out of me. Just watching that uh, episode, I I think that might be the best episode of television for me that I've done. Really, you you <laughs> consider it your favorite? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Don't tell X Files fans. I won't. I promise. <laughs> that's that's a yeah, especially with that kind of a fan base. That's that's a, yeah. a brave admission. <laughs> it's it's interesting because in, in rewatching this show again. It's very clear, at least to me, that if they didn't cast the child part right, this, this episode wouldn't have worked. Right. Um, it's like because the whole thing revolves around this this child interpreter for this being that's not even there. What was your what what was your um, kind of approach to that in the auditioning process? What did you think of Charlie? as a person, as this new being, you know, he shows up and he says, I'm here to warn you. But the fact of the matter is he should really be saying, I was made to warn you. I was built right. to warn you. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was, uh, I remember it was a lot of words <laughs> watching the episode. There's so much like being the mediator between the mom and like saying all these long sentences that I'm sure I didn't know what they meant at the time. Like they're coming to for a war of attrition and all that stuff. <laughs> so it's very, very wordy, uh, but I was impressed that I was able to get it all out. <laughs> what was the dialogue tough? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm usually pretty good with lines, even if I don't know what they mean. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I was always good at just memory stuff. So uh, that sort of came easy, even though I probably didn't know what I was saying. Well, I mean, other than words like attrition, I mean, you knew what was going on. You knew the, you knew the, the framing of the story, I'm assuming. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. What was it like uh, uh, having a a guardian, a the the most uh, uh, the 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 character that was the most you know associated with you and the most caring about you, not in the not, not existing. Even, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that's good for uh, the production saved money for not hiring another actor. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it's hard to say because again, it was like 20 years ago, right. but. Um, it was uh, just a really nice relationship, I thought, that I was shown on screen. And, uh, yeah, I'm just really proud of uh, how it all turned out. Would you like to see Mother? Pardon me? Would you like to see your mother? Yes. Oh, wow. Is that, like, the original drawing? I don't have the original. I photocopied them before transferring them over to uh, MGM. So wow. I have I have one in my archive as well, and I will send I will send mother to you. 
<laughs> but, wow, that's uh, really cool. Yeah, so these I believe this is Ken Rebell's work if I'm if I'm not mistaken. And um so she's a hexapod. Um but you know, it's a it's a face only a son could love. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> for sure. It was one of those one of those things that were I, I'm, I regret that we didn't see them again because they were so extremely cool, but we just have to assume that between the pages of a novel or, or some, some other extra content outside of the, outside of the episodic canon that they were, the rebel faction were taken care of. So, but right. I mean, right. Know, yeah, I was going to ask you, did they ever bring them back? Cause it really seemed like when watching the episode that they kind of left it open. Right. And, uh, yeah. The episode, the main beat that it does uh, change in terms of show canon was these palm scanners that are in the uh, control room are now used right. when opening and closing the iris because oh for the rest Ritu, of the show yeah because the Ritu obviously ah. don't have don't have palms they've got right. claws <laughs> but uh, yeah that was the main beat that was changed so um, yeah this is th this episode was just one of. I think the sweeter stories that was was told in those earlier years, but it also gave us uh, a glimpse into a larger universe um, for uh, the franchise in terms of what was what was possible. So, what was it like? Uh, uh, do you do you recall working uh, with uh, the cast at all in this, especially Richard Dean Anderson, who was almost like a surrogate dad? Yeah, no, I remember working with Richard uh, or Rick. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember uh, working with him. He was very, very, very kind and talked to me a lot uh, off camera and stuff and was just like very interested in me asking if I take acting classes. And back then I was like, oh, I don't take acting classes anymore. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah, either you got it or you don't. You got it, my friend. Uh. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and I remember Amanda Tapping was yes. probably my second on-set crush. Really? <laughs> Who would have been the first, pray tell? Uh, coincidentally enough, it was uh, an actress who, around my age, who did a couple episodes of Stargate. I was just looking her up on IMDb, but uh, her name's Colleen Renison. And she uh... was, uh, in an episode of Millennium, I did as an extra and so I was a boy on the bus, and so it was a lot of work with a bunch of kids there. And so, yeah. Colleen, yeah, we, we talked with her a few years ago. She played uh, Cassandra. I talked with her on another website called GateWorld. She played Cassandra uh, in ah. one episode, and she played uh, an episode in, I think, season three as well with alongside Christopher Judge named Allie. So it's, it's a, you know, Vancouver was a, a relatively small city, relatively small acting pool back in the day, and it's just exploded. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy watching all these shows, and I'm like, oh, I remember working with that guy 20 years ago. I remember working with that guy 20 years ago. Absolutely. <laughs> um, what has it been like being a part of a mythology like the X Files? I was uh, uh, getting uh, communicating with you and getting ready to 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 do this uh, about about a month ago. My buddy Darren, who runs GateWorld, he reached out to me. He said, "Oh, you're you're doing, you're getting Jeff Golk." I said, "Yeah, I'm really excited." He says, "You know, he's basically the key to the X Files, <laughs> right?" And I'm like, "What do you mean? That show lasted for like ten years." He's like, "No, just go and read the wiki page." I was like, "Oh, okay." He he had like alien. He's a big deal, you know. That's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool to be so entrenched and tied into uh, that mythology. Um, yeah. what, what, what was being a part of that show like? It was awesome. Uh, it came sort of out of nowhere. I had done uh, extra work on the X-Files, I think, two times. Okay. And both times my scenes got cut. But uh, Chris Carter, the creator, remembered me and specifically asked me to audition for that role. Um, so I never even had like a regular agent. I still had my extra agent. Um, and so they had yeah, to specifically asked me to audition. I think I did probably three or four auditions. Um, and then I got the part. And then after the first season or th th that I did, which was the last episode that they filmed in Vancouver, uh, I thought, okay, well, that was fun. And then they're like, oh, are you going to be coming back for next season? I was like, I don't know. And then, yeah, I got a call in the <laughs> summer and got to go down to LA and film the first one down there. And yeah, and then they brought me back a couple of times. So just sort of the, the gift that keeps on giving. You're absolutely right. It's such yeah. a, like I was a, a big fan of X Files too. Uh, so when I was allowed to mythology. watch it, yeah, yeah, okay. and uh, but 
yeah, so it was just really cool to be a part of. I stopped sort of, as with most shows, uh, when I'm on them, as soon as I'm in an episode, I kind of stop watching it as much because a bit of the magic seems a little gone. I'm like, I know that guy. He doesn't talk like that. True. True. <laughs> True. That's very much the case. Um, yeah, it, my understanding was that your first episode, uh, the end, was essentially supposed to be the end of that uh, series. The whole series, yeah. They were yeah, going to go to movies. Just... Chris Carter wanted to wanted to make the scope bigger, but Fox said no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't do more. that. More. We need more money. More. <laughs> just just keep on printing yeah <laughs> so and all the better for you yeah no it's fantastic so there, there's a hole in um the mythology in terms of where where uh Mulder exits and i think was taken over by uh, uh the the t-1000 if i'm not mistaken correct yes robert patrick robert yeah. patrick and it, in the end it's revealed that he was hiding out with you the whole time that's right, so, hanging out in the desert, me and Mulder. Mulder and Gibson, probably yeah. playing video games the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> what a what a, uh, a mythology. I, I've been meaning to, I tried to get into the show in college. I watched like the first two seasons and I couldn't, just couldn't get the hang of it. It was it felt too like 90s for me yeah, at well, the it's, time. It's, it's 90s. Very much so. So, But would you recommend watching the, the series from start to finish? Is it worth it even oh, today? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I even watched the pilot. A while ago, because it was just happened to be on TV, and I was like, I think I might start watching this show again from right, the beginning right. too, because uh, yeah, it's just it's pretty good and it's very topical for things now. Right, <laughs> everyone with with uh, uh, shadow governments and and yes, conspiracies and conspiracies. pandemics and yeah, that's a fair point. Exactly, <laughs> jeez, man. <laughs> Out of um, the the roles that you have uh, that have done, um. Can you tell me one that made you uh, re-examine yourself or the world or grow as a person that in a way that you weren't like expecting? Um, was there a, a situation that you came across where, with material where it was like, "Wow, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see this coming." This is this gave just gave you pause or, or made you made you reassess who you are as a person or uh, anything of that kind of ilk. Uh, not, not, not that I could particularly remember. Okay. And then most of my, most, most of my roles lately have just sort of been like one liners mm -hmm. and stuff. So there's not much, uh, room, but, uh, yeah, I sort of, uh, fell back in love with acting, uh, recently cause I took a break for, mm -hmm. I guess from 15 to 30. So I guess 15 years. And then, uh, I just was like, ah, I'm just going to get back into it and uh, get a, like a couple one-liners. And as soon as mm -hmm. I did that, I was just like, ah, this is, this is what I want to do. What and, was the, uh, uh, what made, what made you take the break? If you don't mind my asking, was there just a constant uh, my, grind of it? Or was it like, you know what? I really just want to pursue something else for this per portion of my life. It was a, it was a combination. Uh, Cause as a kid, I was actually kind of working fairly frequently for like a two year period there with all the sci-fi shows right. in the late nineties. And then my agent, who was my extra agent, but she was getting me other work uh, at that time, uh, she retired when I was in high school. Okay. And then so I didn't have an agent. And then my parents thought that it would be better for me to just focus on high school and graduate. And then so I kind of didn't have an agent. X-Files called me anyways. Of course. Nice. Yeah, you're part of that mythology, man. They're and keeping then, their eye uh, on you. And then after I graduated, I moved out to Victoria on Vancouver Island and started playing music. And then so, yeah, I joined and made a band with my cousins. And then so I just did that for about 10 years, moved back and forth from Victoria to Montreal, did a few tours. And, uh, yeah, so I just sort of pursued music for a while and then uh, living in Montreal for too many winters. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we all the decided... snow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's nice, but uh, six months of winter is a little much. I agree. Um, and then, so yeah, we moved back to the West Coast, and uh, they went to the island. I moved back home with my parents, classic millennial, living in the basement suite. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I was just kind of like, well, I need to work. And so I just yeah. got an agent and just started doing auditions again. And uh, yeah. What do you play? Uh, keyboard, keys. Really? Yeah, piano, organ. All right. I, I, I really envy you. <laughs> I just didn't have the fingers. I can sing, but that's about it. Ah, that's nice. So, yeah. Wow. The, uh, what, the, what was the what was the group called? Uh, we were originally called Cheers in the Belfry, 
And then we changed a few members, and then uh, so now we're called the Wix. W I C K S. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, yeah. So we did did a few tours and all self recorded albums for the most part. Um, And then really haven't done much for the last three years, but we're hoping to record something this year. And uh, yeah. There is nothing like getting in front of a of a crowd of people and and just getting on this mental wavelength with them and and through performance and through through the experience of of music. It's a religious experience for all intents and purposes. It activates yeah. that part of the brain that's like, wow, this is awesome. You know, I think that's why people <laughs> love concerts so much is that they, you know, they they want to experience they want to elevate themselves, not just to have a good time and drink and everything else, but they want to, you know, <laughs> just be transported somewhere else. Yeah, and just feeling connection to everybody in the world and the universe. Absolutely. So I have a, a couple of questions here submitted from uh, people in uh, the audience. Uh, Teresa MC uh, wanted to know, Jeff, what advice would you want to give a kid who was wanting to start acting? Uh, well, get into extra work. Yeah. Um, that really helped me because you really understand the long hours and days and hurry up and then wait and then hurry up, get ready. Then you got to wait for the, everything to get set up. And so if, if you can last a eight to 10 hour work day, do an extra work, then that might be something that you should pursue because, uh, yeah, it does. It's, it's, it's long days. <laughs> yeah. Especially nowadays with, I would think with shortened attention spans and people, especially younger people, the TikTok generation being so impatient, I bet <laughs> it would not be an easy thing to pull off for the average, for the average person. Yeah, it's not for everybody. I was working on a show a few months ago, and there's just extras in the background, and one person just looked like they didn't want to be there, and they're supposed to be like a party thing, and the person's like, you don't look like you want to be here. Come on, you got to smile. And they're just like, meh. And they're on camera. Yeah. (laughs) You're being paid, man. You better perform. (laughs) Yeah, it's like they're put off by having to wait for eight hours and getting paid the whole time. When you look at the number of... um, I mean, obviously, you have one-offs like like Ronnie Howard, you know, who went from a very successful child actor to transitioning to be a very successful adult director, uh, with everything in, in between, from American Graffiti to, you know, Star Wars, Han Solo, um, and then someone like Jonathan Brandis, who you know could not make things. I'm assuming you know who he is. Mm, who's okay. that? He was he was an actor uh, who worked very closely with with. Peter DeLuise, actually, in a show called Sequest. And then in the early 2000s, um, fell into depression and took his own life. Ooh. Um, very, just tears me up just, just thinking about him. Um, he, that was, to, to be a, a child performer is not an easy thing to do, especially if, if you achieve, you know, relative or stratospheric say success like Macaulay Culkin, you know, I would think that that would be a very double-edged sword and, and something that, you know, would the cautionary tales would be there. Like if you're going to do this, you need to be on the straight and narrow and held to a certain expectation. Right. And it's, and it's depending on where you start, uh, it's, it's tough when you start at the top, because right. then you, you only got down to go. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and it's not, it's not always going to acting is not a, a, st- a steady stream of uh, work all the time for most actors. Yeah. Fame is often temporary. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and we just assume <laughs> that, you know, they're all, you know, millionaires riding high, but that's, that's, that's yeah. not the case. You know, some people, you know, that's, it's, it's here and there and you get what you can. So. Yeah. And especially as, as a kid, most children, yeah. you know, they're all cute and whatever, but then they grow up and then it's a, t- a whole different ball game. <laughs> uh, Summer I wanted to, to know, um, had you seen Stargate before uh, being featured? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, just the occasional episode again because okay. it was okay. there was no on demand or anything, so you had to tune in live back then. Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, so I probably you know seen maybe half a dozen episodes before I was on it, and I definitely watched it in preparation. Okay. Um, yeah. What did you think it. of the mythology in terms of the Stargate itself as an idea for for uh, vehicle storytelling? I think it's amazing. I remember really liking the original Stargate movie when that came out. Um, 
I don't know what year that was. That 94. Was 94. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I got just, it's kind of, I like the, like, I like sliders. Yes. Like it's, it's very similar. Like I just like that portal. You go to a new place and just connecting everything. Uh, no, I think it's an incredible vehicle for storytelling. Absolutely. Um, Marsha wanted to know when you were talking with mother, um, <laughs> What were you really talking to, or who were you really talking to? What was your what was your sightline for that uh, in on set? And did you get to see at that time the, what the Ritu looked like, or an idea of them? Do you have an idea uh, of what I'm, you were dealing with? I may have been shown a similar picture back in the day, but uh, for the most part on set, um, they would just either put like a piece of tape, or somebody would like hold their hand off camera and say like, "Look here." And so there's always something to look at, but it's usually just like a, a mark from a piece of tape or just a physical person's hand or something. Okay. Yeah. Um, Teresa MC also wanted to know uh, if you, let me see here. It's still being written. Would you like to be able to read minds like Gibson? I, I don't know. Well, you, definitely you are the perfect handy. example of being careful for what you wish for. Yeah, uh, yeah, it could definitely come in handy, but uh, you, you probably don't want to know what everybody's thinking all the time. Absolutely, I, I'm, I'm reading this. If you question. can control it, sure. Right. Exactly. Well, that's that's another thing entirely. I was like, you know, if if I wanted to do this, I, I would get potentially shot at. You know, constantly yeah. getting kidnapped. <laughs> Someone wants to tear off a piece of me. You know, you know the dark side of it as having having to perform it. I would hide out in the back seat of people's cars just to get away yeah. from some of these people. <laughs> It's funny too. I was watching the episode. I don't know if it was intentional, but there was a discussion about me or Charlie, and uh, they said, and Daniel said, uh, "Is this kid psychic?" Exactly. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> that was before, was that before or after your first episode? Uh, that was funny. after. That was after. Okay. Well, th so it could have been a nod. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I, I saw the end. The the first episode that you were in. And then I saw uh, rewatch show and tell, and there was there was one similarity beside their 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 perceptual um, uh, ex experience. Uh, there was one similarity in each of the episodes. Do you know what that is? No. What is it? They both get brain scans done. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Lone gunman, and then yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Phyllis, I wanted to know, was it hard to be so stoic? No, I think that was sort of my vibe back then. I was a very confident child <laughs> uh, actor. Uh, I was enamored with the whole process. Uh, I sort of changed as I got older, but as a kid, you don't have any fears of anything or self-doubts, and uh, I just really enjoyed it, and that was sort of who I was. <laughs> Are you a South Park fan at all? Oh, yeah. So uh, the, the first shot that you come through, that's a profile shot of you and it, and it pans up. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, it's Kenny. Oh, it's Kenny? <laughs> see? <laughs> I can see that. That's funny. Uh, Marsha said, uh, you mentioned uh, Peter Dave gave you a, a Sega game. Uh, do you still, do you still uh, play video games? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. What are you playing? Uh, right now I'm playing NHL 22 um and elder scrolls online oh okay are you excited yes. about the new one coming out i am i'm almost caught up to all the chapters i i only started playing it like last year okay. but uh, it's, it's really helped me through the pandemic <laughs> i can imagine so i'm i i I'm trying to get into skyrim oh um, that's fantastic yeah. yeah so but i've heard that like the mods you want it. You want to get either a mod modded version because the the textures are better, or get the uh, the there's there's like a an HD version available now. Right. Yeah. Legendary version or something. Yeah. Exactly. I want to yeah, get. I haven't that. played that since I remember. I played that when it first came out, and I played it the hell out of it, hell out of it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah. That that's a really good uh, video game series. My first experience was I played Morrowind. That's my all time favorite video game. I think. The the uh. The nature of these sandbox games is just insane. You can you can disappear into that world, and you have to yeah. wonder about the psyche of some of these people. It's like they have no reason to come out, yeah. except yeah. to eat and sleep. <laughs> uh, I definitely was like that with Morrowind. Absolutely, <laughs> you know, it's just the the uh, 
the experiences that that our children are going to be having living in these worlds with their VR. Oh headsets yeah, and nowadays else, it's creepy. It's just it's it's <laughs> amazing and creepy at the same time. Yeah. Tracy wanted to know: uh, Have you done any voice work? Um, I did when I was younger. Okay. Uh, just like a couple odd episodes, I was on like some show Sherlock Holmes of the 24th century. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, but nothing really recently. Okay, Sherlock Holmes in the 22nd century. Yes, absolutely. The adventures of well, depending on the episode, there's a there's a lot of. I was on, I, I don't know why I think it says I was on like a bunch, but I only did one episode. Oh really? Okay, <laughs> I yeah. see. Well, IMDb, you can never trust it. Oh yeah, I know. It says my birthday is December something or January first. January first, eighty seven. Yeah, that's not right. Okay, I'll tell them. <laughs> that's great. My birthday is October twenty third, nineteen eighty six. We will make that update, everybody. Um, <laughs> would you? I would think that you know the, the next. If if I were in your place, I would be going for uh, uh, video game voice parts. You know, I've been thinking about that, that content. I had, but when I'm playing Elder Scrolls, I'm just like, oh, wow, like this is, I, I kind of tell myself that I'm doing a little bit of research if I do want to get into voice acting, yeah. you know? You know, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, pl play the games whose who's, uh, voice work is particularly good. So we just had Sue Ann Braun on last week who played uh, Hathor in Stargate, and she was in Dying Light 2. So mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those that I've been uh, meaning to get into more heavily. There's just so much stuff out there. You can't play it all. You can't watch it all. You can't no. do it all. <laughs> And it's like, you know, there's a world out there, too, that you may want to check yeah. into from time to time, right? So, totally. Absolutely. Um, let me see here real quick. Okay. Amy Klebus. Since the cast were just big kids themselves, would they try to make you laugh? On, I, think they're, I think on Stargate we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, well, definitely Richard Dean Anderson was very... Very playful. I remember playing like rock, paper, scissors with them <laughs> and different sorts of games in between scenes and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but everybody was super nice from what I remember. And uh, yeah, that was one of the craziest sets too because it was like almost like a, a real base. Like you, there's the Stargate room and then you walk down the halls and that's where everything's shooting and it goes up to the little thing where there's the technician who opens the gate. And I'll just say it was a, probably the most incredible set I had been up to that time. And I remember standing in the Stargate the first time, and I was just like, holy smokes. It was my first green screen oh. experience. Like, wow, this is pretty neat. This is huge. There. Oh, and then another funny thing I just remembered. Uh, the technician who opens the gate at the beginning of the episode, because uh, I it happened to be on TV like a year ago, and I just watched the intro, and I was taking acting classes. And I was like, why does that voice sound familiar? I'm like, oh, my God, that's my acting teacher. Wow. <laughs> so I was taking classes from, yeah, his name's Daniel Bacon. Yes, and, yes, he was yeah, a co-star so in that episode. He yeah, was, yeah. Your so acting coach. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, I started doing some audition classes like a few years ago, and then I was like, hey, you were in that episode. Oh, this was after? Yeah. I got it. Okay. Yeah, no, it was like, it was like two or two years ago, and I was like, hey, Dan. And I took a, a video on my phone, and I was like, is this you? It's like, oh my god! Man. So that was like one of his first parts too. So it's pretty, pretty funny. This franchise, um, seventeen seasons. Uh, you were, you were really. In the second oh, year I guess SG One was how many? Ten. And Atlantis 10? was okay. five, and Universe was two. Um, okay. It always, it always made me uh, sad that we never got to to see what happened to Charlie after he went off uh, with the Tokra. Did he live? Did he die? Yeah, and, I'd love to find out. Yeah, watching that episode, I. It's like, oh, that really left that open ended. If they ever bring back Stargate, I'm game. Absolutely, you know, there's still some Toker out there, so I wouldn't be surprised. Um, it's uh, it's it's a, a an enormous mythology, and one that I'm hoping now that Amazon has secured uh, uh, MGM just in the past couple of days here that. You know, oh, really? Yeah, and oh, I'm hoping the next few months here we'll get an announcement of a new uh, a new series that's hopefully set in the Brad Wright universe. So we can only hope. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, if there's an audience for it and they own it, then they'll they'll uh, make it. Absolutely. I even true. heard that there was even some very preliminary discussions of new X Files reboot as well, or something. Because now that Disney owns it, 
That's true. Yeah. Disney has yeah. has absorbed it, and I know that they came back for a, either like a tenth or an eleventh season in the past um, a few. Yeah, years. they did a revival for a couple of years. Yeah, that's actually what got me back into acting because I was in Montreal and I was like, oh, they might call me back. Uh, I should probably start taking classes. Be ready so to I go. Be comfortable. Yeah, but Absolutely. then I never got the call. Um, yeah. let's see here. Uh, Dlalok, is there any actor or actress that you think uh, you would enjoy working with? Uh, who was one of your favorites uh, in in the past? So who I, I'd like to work with again? Yes. Um, definitely Chris Owens. He was in the X-Files. Okay. Uh, I met up, uh, I went to a convention in Chicago a couple years back, and uh, it was really bizarre to see all the actors again. And I like had been, it was my first convention and uh, but it was just like almost like no time has passed. And they're like, oh my god, you look so different. I'm like, yeah, I had a big beard. It's like hey, I got a little less hair up here, a lot more down more here. <laughs> 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 yeah, so he was actually a really nice, fun guy. Um, and then obviously Richard Dean Anderson would be incredible. <laughs> um, yeah, who, who are probably. Your, um, who who are your heroes in 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 the in the work? Um, that you look at and you say, man, that what they do is just, they've got it. They've like, like Rick said, you've got it, kid. You know, what is it? What is, what is <laughs> uh, well, it that one of my all time favorite characters going back to Lost is uh, Jack in Lost, Matthew Fox. I really like that role. Uh, I think my, fa- my favorite part was, I think, in season must have been three or something when he was getting off his rocker and he had his big beard listening, driving around in Nirvana and he like, oh, in LA. Some pharmacy or something and knocks yes. over a bunch of stuff. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but then, as for like actual integrity and stuff, I'm a big fan of Peter Dinklage. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he's definitely someone I look up to. Being a, a, a another a little person as well, uh, I definitely look up to him. Peter is uh, one of those who have really broken through that that barrier, uh, right. especially with like Cyrano. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. really looking forward to seeing that. Me too. Because it's just that he's he is is a reminder that you know it's it's not about size, it's about performance. And you know, like in some of his more recent movies, his size isn't even brought up, you know. Or if it right. is, it's 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 a one off to say, Yes, we acknowledge this and we move on, you know, we move on right, with, yeah. with the storytelling. And yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I, think the, I think he's brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so there's so many like I, I, cause I'm four foot six, like half of my roles in like the recent past is like tiny man, diminutive man. And like my size is part of the character. And I really appreciate how Peter is just, you know, it can be an aspect, but it shouldn't be the determining quality of the character. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Jeff, this has been um, terrific having you on oh, and fantastic it's been uh, a goal of mine to to bring you uh in to to discuss some of these uh, to discuss the, the classic episode that you were in it just means means a lot to me that you took the time oh my pleasure happy happy to do it and i'm i love the fact that you're a, that you're a lost super fan this is terrific so <laughs> i'm gonna be getting in touch with you and say hey what did you think about this so this is great man um I, I appreciate having you on and uh, it, it means it means a lot that you were able to join us. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I will be in touch with you. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff Golka, Ritu Charlie in Stargate SG-1's Show and Tell. MGM has purchased, or excuse me, the other way around. Amazon has purchased MGM. It's definitive as of... Uh, this past week, I think uh, GateWorld posted the story. Let's have a, a quick look at it here. Um, yeah, done deal. Amazon owns Stargate as of today. So uh, this Darren did a great article on GateWorld, and I seriously suggest you go ahead and uh, check it out. In the meantime, however, our resident... Uh, TV and film marketing guru, Jenny Steven. Uh, I wanted to get in touch with her because she does the state of the gate updates with us uh, on a quarterly or biannual basis based on what's going on uh, in the franchise. And she said that she wants to wait a little bit before doing another one so that she can get more information. 
uh, with uh, with the merger and everything else that's happening because the dust is still in the air. It's just beginning to settle. But I said, is there something that you can contribute today? And so she said, I'll get you a video. So here is a note from Jenny Stiven about the merger. Hey, everybody, it's Jenny Stiven. David and I are going to be doing State of the Gate sometime in the next couple of weeks once we get more information from friends over at MGM and Amazon. And in the meantime, I just really wanted to be able to reach out to everybody and say that I am extremely excited that the deal went through, that we're moving past whatever obstacles might have happened there, and we are moving into what I'm considering to be the cautiously optimistic stage. I think that there are only open window, open door opportunities for not just us as Stargate fans, but for all of our friends at MGM and Amazon and the great, amazing content that MGM brings with it. There are so many opportunities creatively with the content that MGM has across all of its departments and divisions. So I'm excited to hear what happens next. And most of all, this is that perfect moment when something like this happens, where all of our hopes and our positivity and our optimism have a place to go. There's something for us to direct it at. And that's where I really want all of us to be right now is to be supportive, to be out there supporting any Stargate content that we can see that we've got, Keep up the great work on all the fan art and all the amazing work, the Legos. Oh my gosh, the Lego ships and the Lego gates that I've voted a million times for. All of this shows and continues to show now Amazon that there's a strong audience for new content. So I just can't see us going wrong with continuing in that area. So shout out to 365 Days of Stargate, who have been amazing for, obviously, almost 365 days. To Joe Malazzi, who absolutely beats that drum. To Brad, to our friends over at The Companion. I think everybody who is doing their very best to keep this alive has kept this front and center for the people who are the decision makers. So again, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm a bit of a Pollyanna, but I think that we are moving in the right direction. Uh, as soon as we know more, then David and I will come back and talk to you about State of the Gate for sure. So have a great weekend and have fun with David and his interviews. Bye, guys. Jenny Stiven, everyone. Uh, she will be joining us for a future Stargate uh, State of the Gate in the next uh, uh, few weeks here as things pan out with uh, Amazon's acquisition of MGM. Before we go, if you like what you've seen in this episode, please consider uh, clicking that like button and sharing uh, this content to uh, friends who are Stargate fans as well. Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. But if you want to support the show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag. We're now offering t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages, as well as the cups and other accessories in a variety of sizes and colors at dialthegate.com. From the Merchandise tab you, can click on a tab, you can click on a specific design to see what items are being offered. Checkout is fast and easy. You can use a credit card or PayPal. Just visit dialthegate.com slash merch. And thank you so much for your support. Big thanks to my producer, Linda Gategabber Fury, as well as my moderating team, Summer, Tracy, uh, Keith, Jeremy, Reese, and Anthony. These people are the ones who are uh, helping me to bring you the show uh, every week. And big thanks to Frederick Marcoux at Concepts Web. He's our web developer on Dial the Gate. And to Jeremy, our webmaster, who keeps uh, dialthegate.com up uh, to speed based on the schedule. We have coming up, and you know what? I really should just have this ready to go, but God forbid I ever do that. We have Britt Irvin, who played Marin next week on Dial the Gate, the 26th of March at 12 noon Pacific time. Uh, the classic episode, uh, Learning Curve. I think it really exemplifies what the franchise is all about in terms of a message that's not beating you over the head, but it's just telling a good story and entertaining. And then at 2 p.m. on the 26th as well, two hours later, we have a trivia head-to-head, -head, which is going to be trivia five or six. Just me and Darren Sumner from GateWorld, classic uh, Stargate SG-1 uh, episodes. So we are going to have a whole lot of fun next week. And then on April the 2nd at 12 noon, Joseph Malazzi will be back to discuss Stargate Universe Season 1. And more guests are being scheduled as we speak. So just trucking along with one or two uh, shows per week. They're going to be picking up a little bit more. We're going to be having uh, two episodes 
uh, together a little bit more commonly for the next little bit here. Some of them are going to be pre-recorded. My schedule's a little bit wonky, so we're going to see what happens. I appreciate everyone for tuning in and helping to make the the show uh, possible. My my team here. Thank you guys so much, and to the audience uh, for uh, taking time out of your schedule every week to reminisce about Stargate. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. We'll see you on the other side.